country reeling with economic ruin after the bursting of an investment bubble. A city lacking any real effective police force. A working class tired of being pushed down by the moneyed few. It's 1723, and the stage is set for a new kind of hero. A young man of small frame, charming wit, and a real knack for escaping from prison captures the hearts and minds of the people of England as he embarks on a whirlwind crime spree. And welcome to Remember, Remember, the podcast about history, mysteries. And did you know that the debt incurred by the British government in the 1720s when the South Sea bubble burst wasn't paid off until 2015? Money doesn't exist, does it? (laughs) No. You know what I mean? (laughs) You think about this. Have you heard of the South Sea bubbles? Is this a thing you learned about in school at all, Matthew? It sure ain't. Well, it really could be its own full episode, but... Too long didn't read. The South Sea Company was a stock speculation scheme meant to consolidate British government debt. Values were inflated, insider trading was rampant, and a shit ton of investors ended up ruined. And this does matter to today's story. But before I tell you why, I should introduce you to my co-host. Oh, you're doing introductions this episode. That's nice. I actually remember to write it in. Yeah. A rogue and a scoundrel. Matthew Sly I Jude. And you can call me Paula, the podcaster general. Are you saying I look shifty? Is that what you're trying to insinuate in this? I just sly. You're sneaky. You're, yeah. Yes, you could just say, yeah, you, I look untrustworthy to you. Well, good. That's cl- clearly not what I'm saying at all. All right, carry on with your podcast. <laughs> so, much like Matthew is, uh, I won't say angry, but uh, angry about his nickname. I'm furious. (laughs) People at this time were angry at the establishment. The city of London ran rampant with poverty, with no real way for people to change their circumstances or have any sense of control over their lives. Can I ask a question quickly? Yeah. How is that different to today? (laughs) There was no established police force. We have a police force, I guess, but they just don't do anything. (laughs) No real way to investigate or solve crime. Want to break into a house and steal a bunch of stuff? Go for it. What's there to stop you? I always said this, right? Imagine being alive in 1666. Just kill someone. As long as no one sees you do it. They can't trace you back to it. They just can't prove a thing. There's no forensics. This is the world that Jack Shepard was born into on March 4th, 1702 in the Spitalfields. Do you know the Spitalfields? Yeah, Spitalfield Market. I've been there many times. There's going to be a lot of things in in this episode that are like references to areas of London that I've put in because they might mean something to you or some of our listeners, but they mean nothing to me. You know what? I've never actually thought of the word Spitalfield Spitalfield in general as as weird. And hearing you say it, I go, oh, yeah, it is kind of a weird word. Kind of a weird word. Spitalfield. But it's spelled Spitalfields. That's how we pronounce it as well. The Spitalfields. Spitalfields. (laughs) (laughs) So Jack was named after an older brother who had died. His father and younger sister died when he was very young, leaving just Jack, his mother, and his other older brother, Thomas. He sounds like the protagonist in a low-budget sci-fi novel series. I was going to say, if you're going to suggest he sounds like the protagonist in a Charles Dickens novel, yes. (laughs) Well, it's just because in Stargate SG-1, it's Jack O'Neill, and in Stargate Atlantis, it's John Shepard. Well, his name was technically John Shepard, because Jack is a nickname for John for some reason. Just making me think of Stargate. Which is great. I feel like you're just going to think of Stargate no matter what gets said, honestly. I'm going to be thinking about Stargate regardless. That's correct. Stargate and the Roman Empire, the two things that take up most of Matthew's brain. True. That's a reference to last week's episode. If you haven't listened to our episode about gladiators, do it. But right now we're talking about Jack, who lived in poverty. And so as a child, he was sent to the workhouse. When Jack was 15, he got an apprenticeship with a carpenter. So... 
This was essentially a seven-year indentured servitude kind of situation. To gain a skill. Right, yeah. That detail about like seven years of working for free for someone, aside, this was a really good thing for Jack. London was growing, so carpenters were in high demand. And once he was able to have his own shop, he probably wouldn't have a hard time getting work. And for the first five-ish years, things seemed to be on track for Jack. But with less than two years left of his apprenticeship, Jack fell in with what you might call the wrong crowd. You know, the kind that convinces you to have a party while your parents are out of town and then they show up with weed and beer. Paula, you're trying to make it out that that ever happened to you. No, it never happened to me. I never was part of the wrong crowd. Yeah, you didn't have parties unless you were all bringing a sleeping bag over, listening to Christian music, watch, watching Veggie Tales, talking about which member of Hanson you fancy, and then going to bed by nine. Not by nine. That's Paula's life. Nothing wrong with that. There is, but carry on. Jack began spending a lot of time at the Black Lion Tavern, where he loved drinking ale, making friends with the petty thieves who hung out there, and spending time with the uh, pretty women. I used to go to a pub called the Black Lion, but it was in Kilburn, so I used to live in London. That's going to be a running theme of this. To put Spitalfield Market into some type of context, it's in East London, and it's basically right near Whitechapel. Yes, yes, that is, I remember, I didn't write that down, but in my research it was like, and in a very nearby neighborhood, uh, X number of years later, another famous criminal, well, yeah. It's, yeah, it's the same area of town as Jack the Ripper. In mm -hmm. fact, you have to, when you get off the train to walk to Brick Lane and stuff in East London, you go through Spitalfield Market. Mm. I've done it many times. In fact, me and you have done that exact walk. I was going to ask, have we walked through this area? We probably yes, have. We yeah. have. Me and you have both walked through Spitalfield Market together. Well, next time we do it, I'm going to be thinking about Jack. Rather, you're thinking about me, but Paula, you, you're very often thinking about another man, but that is because you are married, so that's fine. <laughs> so Jack is thinking about pretty women and one particular pretty woman. Big mistake. Huge and yes, I'm making a pretty woman the movie joke because Jack fell in love with a prostitute and petty thief, Edgeworth Bess. Birth name, Elizabeth Lyon. But we're going to call her Bess. A lot of people say things like how Bess used her feminine wiles to lure poor innocent Jack down a path of sin. A real Eve tempting Adam kind of situation. He's not to blame at all. He's, uh, it's not his fault. That woman. He's just an innocent man. He's just a normal man. We're just innocent men. <laughs> but the way I like to imagine it is that Jack wanted to impress Bess with pretty things he couldn't afford. And she was like... Yeah, exactly. She was like, I don't know. I steal stuff sometimes. You could try doing that. And he did. And he was good at it. He had a lot of opportunity. His job as a carpenter's apprentice meant he was in and out of a lot of people's houses and shops on jobs. So he was able to cache joints to come back to later or pocket small items when no one was looking during his errands. His first theft, apparently, was some silver spoons while out on a job for his master. Carpentry also gave him some handy skills. He knew exactly how doors and windows worked how they were installed, how to uninstall and then reinstall them. <laughs> yeah. You don't need to unlock the door if you can just take the door off its hinges. Exactly. <laughs> he didn't have to break in, just take a door off his hinges. Yeah, it was what I have written here. Yeah, he doesn't have to break any windows. He knows how to, like, take things apart, put them back together. How to make a lock, how to take the lock out. He knows how to do that. Jack could also fit into small spaces because he was small. He's described as being 5'4 and deceptively strong for his slight build. I can picture him now, especially if he's been working hard since the age of, you know, a kid and doing manual labor. He's probably sinewy, but very strong. He had dark hair, a charming wide smile and a slight stutter. Oh, he sounds honestly quite charming. Yeah, well, you can see why people start to really, everybody likes Jack. Everybody likes Jack. There is actually, this is a side note, and I didn't really write it into my script because it's wild conjecture as far as I can tell. But there is this theory, and I think maybe even a Netflix TV show, that is the idea that Jack was actually a woman. 
I guess because of how small he was? No, I think that, you know, 300 years ago, you could still be a sh- on the short side for a man. Yeah. You still get men today who are five foot four. Yeah. It's not like it's an unreasonable thing. It's below average height, but it's not massively unusual. Yeah, I don't know that I buy. I think, yeah, there's a fun idea. There's, I think the like someone disguised as something they're not is a fun idea. But I, I don't see, who knows? Let's be honest. Netflix play pretty fast and loose with retellings of history. Yeah. Let's just leave it at that. (laughs) So Jack got deeper and deeper into the life of a burglar and quit his apprenticeship with like a year and a half left of it, moving in with Bess and living together as husband and wife, though I don't think they ever got actually legally married. Yeah. Whenever something says living together as husband and wife, they mean instead of saying they were husband and wife and lived together. I feel like that's kind of a bit of a euphemism going yeah. on there, you know? They were common law married, I guess. Yeah. yeah. They were living together as husband and wife in the same way that other people live as husband and wife, which means doing it. <laughs> then Bess got arrested and taken to St. Giles Roadhouse, a small jail meant to temporarily hold suspected criminals. It's where the roundhouse kick was invented. That's where the roundhouse kick was invented. Exactly. Um, I want to say them all like St. Giles. I feel like that's the way to say it. Um, that's how I feel like you would say it. Well, your first mistake is saying Saint. St. 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 Giles. St. Giles. So Jack tried to visit Beth at St. Giles Roadhouse. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. But the beetle, who's like a local official, wouldn't let him see her. So he just breaks her out of jail. And they escape. Sounds reasonable. Bus her out. Perfectly acceptable. I read in one place that he does this by like knocking out the beetle and then busting her out. But I only heard, I only saw that in one place. So I don't know if that's how he did it. There's not a lot of people kind of gloss over this one. She's out, essentially. She's out. There we go. So Jack starts doing burglaries with his brother, Tom, all the while getting more connected with other members of the London criminal underworld. And this is where we meet Jonathan Wilde, self-appointed thief-taker general. Big nerd, giving yourself a name like that, right? Look, if you're going to be self-appointed, just, you know, it's like I'm self-appointed dong of the year 2019. (laughs) Well, I self-appointed myself podcaster general at the start of the episode, so. True, you did. But you've been doing that for a while now. You say dong of the year. 2019. Yeah. Honestly, it was an honor. It really was. So at this time, crime prevention, detection and prosecution was kind of like one big neighborhood watch. Like I said earlier in the episode, London didn't have a police force yet. So they relied on regular citizens to act as informants, witnesses and as stolen good recovery. And this all came with rewards. You could get paid to testify in court. No, I see no ethical problem with that. None. None at all. Yeah, that doesn't sound like people of the day would even have agreed with that making much sense. But, you know, it's, honestly, that's kind of how London is now. It's how the United Kingdom is now. We don't really have a police force. We just have people... We have social media. That's about it. <laughs> and the only police force that we have is there to arrest you in case you say something on social media that is not allowed. But if your house gets robbed in the UK, no one's coming. <laughs> The rewards at this time were like really good too. Like they were very tempting. So the reward for turning in a criminal was 40 pounds in 1720s. It's thousands of pounds in today money. Thousands. It's huge. You also could get paid for returning stolen property to its owners. So I'm assuming that there's a cottage industry here where you steal something then return it Yep. and claim the reward. Yeah, funny, Jonathan Wilde also had that thought, Mr. Thief Taker General. He made a whole business out of turning in criminals and returning the items they had stolen, which he was not doing out of the goodness of his heart. He was doing this to take out the competition because though he paraded himself around like an enforcer of law and protector of the people, really, he was the ringleader of a criminal organization. Again, that's just like the police nowadays. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a fan of the police. I'm not a against the police kind of guy. I think police are good. I think police are great. But 
They're also breaking the law a lot. Let's be real. They're people with power, and that can be uh, abused very easily. Crush Jonathan Wild, and he'd turn you in for the reward money. Didn't want to use him as your fence so he could get paid for returning the goods you'd stolen? He'll pay a witness to testify against you in court. And our boy Jack didn't want to use Jonathan Wilde as his fence. He wanted to stay independent. So Wilde had it out for Jack. And it wasn't long before he had a chance to act against him. You're using the word fence here as though it's something that we all know. Oh, yeah. So a fence is you steal something and then you give it to your fence to like sell. And then you get money from that. So it's the person who's moving your stolen goods for you. Gotcha. Tom, Jack's brother, gets arrested for stealing. Now, Tom had already been in trouble for theft before, and he sported a brand on his hand to prove it. First time Tom had gotten off easy, this brand was a a much less harsh punishment than what it could have been, which is the death penalty. Or you lose your hand. Like, the punishment for even small acts of thievery at this time could be death. Well, contextualize this. This is, I mean, it's over the channel, but this is Les Mis era. You know, I stole a loaf of bread and I'm doing hard labor for 20 years, you know. Yeah, well, and that's because without an organized police force, the government didn't know how to stop thieves. They didn't know how to control this. You have to have deterrence. Exactly. Only, which do not work. Exactly. They don't. They don't, clearly. But the best they could come up with was to try and deter people from committing the crimes in the first place. So the the smallest crimes, the ones that were easiest to commit, held the harshest punishments because they felt like that was their only way to stop people from doing it. I'd argue that when you say the best they could come up with is probably not 100% correct. That's Because fair. there's enlightened thinkers at the time. Sure. Right? I mean, we're talking about hugely intelligent population in the upper classes. And I'm sure that they could have thought of different things, but they just chose not to implement those things. Right. Yes. Yeah. When I say, I say it's a little bit tongue in cheek, I guess, when I say the best they could come up with uh, was execution for minor theft. Tom did not want this death penalty, and he'd already been caught before. So they're like, oh, you've done it again? Well, we'll just hang you. So to save his own hide, he ratted out his brother Jack as being the person behind the crimes that Tom had been arrested for. Oh, that's that cuts deep. It hurts a bit. Yeah. Yeah. When Wilde heard there was a warrant out on Jack, he had his associate, James Helen Fury Sykes. That's not shorter. That's not good. That's a rubbish nickname. You don't want to be called Helen Fury? I mean, that's pretty scary. Look, if you're a comic book character, a woman named Helen Fury. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> that's brilliant. But if if your nickname is longer than your actual name, it's stupid. <laughs> Do you reckon he had Helen Fury tattooed on his oh, knuckles? Oh, a hundred percent. You've got a million percent, right? Hell. Fury, definitely. Uh, definitely. I picture that. Also, let's write that Helen Fury idea down because that's great. Yeah, that's brilliant. TM that. TM, 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 TM. It's good. It's really good. So James Sykes lures Jack into a trap by inviting him to a tavern to play a game of Skittles. Which I was like, what do you mean? You shove your mouth full of a bunch of rainbow candies until, like, want to see who can eat the most? No, that's not it. I think Matthew knows what this no, is. No, I've talked to you about... I've talked to you about Skittles before. You have? Skittles is our version. We've, I mean, Rodney has spoke about this, our Canadian friend yeah. and boss. <laughs> he, it, it's like Skittles is what you play. It's a form of bowling. Like America had temp in bowling and Skittles is what you could play mm-hmm. in the UK. Yeah. And it's the, the ball is smaller and the Skittles are smaller and the alley's smaller. It's more of a in the back of a pub game. Yeah. And when I was growing up, my Dad would go bowling, which was crown green bowling, which is where you you bowl on a on a on a actual on grass. Mm. It's much more like uh, the f- bulls, like a French game. What did we do in Wales? That was skittles. Oh, because it was a little. It's like a little ball. 
It doesn't have holes in it, but it's like a small ball that you can hold in your... I mean, it's bigger than a, a baseball, but you know. It's like the size of a grapefruit. And then you like chuck it down the lane. And I've got memories of doing that as a kid where I'd, there, there was a pub and at the back of the pub there was a skittle lane and we'd play skittles while my dad was in playing was bowling. So Jack is invited to play this game. I love Skittles. I'll be going. But unfortunately, this game of Skittles didn't happen because James, Helen Fury Sykes, didn't actually want to play Skittles. He wanted to lure Jack into a trap. I know. Oh, my gosh. Uh, So the authorities were there, waiting and ready to arrest Jack, taking him to St. Giles Roadhouse to be held overnight and questioned in the morning. And this is is where Jack begins to spark the interest of the people of London. Because he doesn't stick around to be questioned in the morning. Jack, using his carpentry skills, broke through the timber ceiling of his top floor cell, tied together (laughs) the blankets from his bed, and lowered himself to the ground where a crowd had gathered to see what all the noise was about. Jack joins the crowd. Honestly, Matthew, I could see you. (laughs) Jack is a scamp, and I think of you as a scamp. Does he start looking up at the building going, yay, what's happening? Is that? (laughs) Yeah, uh, he joins the crowd, points to the rooftop, and shouts, Matthew, I have a a quote from him that I would like you to read as Jack. I'm going to send it to you in the chat here. Oi, I see the bugger right there. See those shadows moving? Says something basically like that. And while everyone is distracted, looking for whatever he was talking about, he slips away, free as a bird. (laughs) Jack the lad more than Jack the shepherd. Well, 100%, that is one of his official nicknames. (laughs) Is it? Yes. (laughs) Jack the lad? Yeah. Yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Lad, 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 lad. I just love that he escapes... Goes in with the crowd, goes, oh, yeah, I see him there. They all look, and then he's like, suckers, and he leaves. Like, <laughs> um, bye-bye now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what a. He probably pickpocketed three or four people on his way on out. On the way out, probably <laughs> did. I'll talk about this more later, but uh, he is an inspiration for a lot of characters we're familiar with, including the Artful Dodger. When I think of the Artful Dodger, I think of the musical act, the Artful Dodger. Oh. I think of the character from Oliver Twist. Rewind. And the crowd say, but select I'm curious how much of that Matthew's going to leave in the final edit. I think just leave the whole thing in. It was longer than I've left in, just so you know. I myself can think of two famous carpenters, right? Jack and Jesus. They took slightly different paths in life. Both went their own way uh, against society. Both inspired the people. Maybe this escape made Jack... A bit cocky, because very soon after, he was caught in Leicester Fields, which is modern-day Leicester Square, for whoever that means something to. Leicester Square is, like, one of the most central parts of central London. This was established as, like, a really... It was very posh at the time. Yeah. Uh, Like, fancy people. So, he was there uh, picking pockets. (laughs) Look, you got to do what you got to do. Leicester Square right now... Just so you know, it's kind of like where the National Gallery is. It's right near Piccadilly Circus. It's it's where the Theatre District is. Covent Garden, that kind of area. It's central, central London. If you, you need to get off at Leicester Square, probably to go to, to the West End. So that's where he is picking pockets. And that's where he gets caught. This time, he was sent to St. Anne's Roundhouse in Soho to be held. So Vess comes to visit him in the morning, but she's recognized as his wife and Maybe also as that woman who escaped from her cell at St. Giles. Yeah. (laughs) So she's thrown into the cell with Jack. I mean, they're doing it in that cell, right? Oh, yeah. Well, at the time, too, like the way prisons worked was is so different. They were way overcrowded and it was not uncommon for wives to like stay the night. I mean, prisons are still overcrowded. (laughs) Yes. But but like a conjugal visit wasn't. In the cell. They were just like, uh, you could, yeah, sure, come in, stay the night, whatever, leave the next morning. So they throw her in the cell with him. And then they are transferred to the new prison in Clerkenwell. Again, uh, honestly, these locations really mean nothing to me. But I assume if you know London at all, then they're interesting little tidbits for you. 
a thing is you saying you don't know where Leicester Square is is like me saying I don't know where Times Square is. It's it's just baffling to me. But yeah, <laughs> but Clerkenwell is um, a different district of London. Yeah, so they have transferred them there. Yeah, Clerkenwell is where the uh, City University of London is, I think. So putting Bess and Jack in a cell together was probably not the best idea because, of course, they'd smuggled in a file. And in less than a week, they'd filed through their manacles and removed one of the bars from their window. Jack, again, tied together bedsheets, lowered down Bess, then lowered down himself. I like this guy. He's great. He's great. Where they'd lowered themselves to was the yard of the Bridewell prison next door, which is where they held a lot of like <laughs> prostitutes and yeah. like debtors, I think. He'd broken out of a prison into a prison. Yes. Classic. With a 22-foot high gate, which they then climbed over <laughs> and escaped. When people found out about this, they could not stop talking about it. So remember Jack, we've said he's a pretty small dude, right? Well, Bess is the opposite of that. She was a larger woman and was certainly bigger than Jack. And people were fascinated by the image of this small man somehow carrying and lowering and boosting this much larger woman as they escaped together. It's love, Paula. It's love. He was getting nicknames. Gentleman Jack. Jack the Lad. And the most curious one to me, Honest Jack. Yeah, that one doesn't make as much sense, if I'm honest. I'm thinking about it. That one, there's an irony to it, which I appreciate, I suppose. He, I don't know, people liked him. He was becoming like a working class hero. He was charming, witty, sneaky, strong, non-violent, which I think is a big part of it. Huge, yeah. And he was sticking it to the man. Women wanted him. Men wanted to be him. Men wanted him. Women wanted to be him. But how long could it last? Find out how Jack goes down in history in our next episode, part two, a rogue, a scoundrel, and a celebrity walk into a tavern. Thank you so much for doing this research on this episode of uh, Remember, Remember, Paula. I appreciate you so much. This has been interesting and fascinating. It's honestly something I didn't know about. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I can't wait to tell you the rest of Jack's story next week. And if you want to hear that, a great way to do it is to hit the subscribe button. Because then you'll be notified when the video comes out. It helps us as well. Tell someone about the show. That really is the best thing you can do. Share it. Do something. Be proactive. Leave a comment. We'd appreciate all of that. All those things really do help us out. And... One thing that will really help us out is coming back next week, and we'll see you then. Bye. Bye, everyone.